the more that we understand these principles and how this kind of aspect works, the more likely we are to be successful at it. So I'm all for popularizing these ideas in whatever way they can be visualized because I think everyone on the planet needs to understand how to make this work. And the second reason is um, a little less global, and that's just that I think there's a lot of confusion and there are a lot of straw man arguments, both for and against nonviolent direct action. Um, and most of them don't actually engage with what nonviolent direct action is. Most of them are based on understandable emotional reactions to the state of things. So on the one side, you have people who are very attached to actual pacifism, which is very different than nonviolent direct action. Um, and they have their own reasons for that, spiritual reasons, emotional reasons. And I don't even think it's worth arguing on that level. I mean, there's certain so discussions to be had, but you're not going to shift people who have a profound moral uh, attachment to nonviolence, um, to, to true pacifism. I mean, I have friends who are Quakers, and that's the center of their lives. You know, that's 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 their their north. That's their guiding principle. And nothing that I say or do is going to shift that. And I don't particularly even want to shift it. We need those people too. You know. And so I, I guess I just don't want DGR to be the kind of smug militants who feel like we have the answers and everybody else is just too naive to understand. And I see that sometimes, and I don't want us to be those people. I would rather that we be thoughtfully engaged even if we disagree. But that means really understanding what nonviolence is and what it isn't. Um, so it's not pacifism, for instance. And a lot of the pacifisms, pacifists claim it is theirs, and they're wrong because it's not. It doesn't work by moral persuasion which is what most pacifists want to believe, and it's not true. It's not much of a star play, and that's not true of the theory. So we're just going to go through some of this because um, I would just like us all as an organization to have a little bit better grounding in the history of this and what the principles are and how they're supposed to work. And then you can take it or leave it, you know, but it's at least understand what it is and what it isn't, I think it's important. So Gene Sharp is probably the number one theorist about nonviolent direct action. He's written, I don't know, 30 books about it, some historical, some more theoretical. Um, but I would say that in all of human history, he's probably the person who is responsible for more revolutions on this planet than anyone else. And that includes Karl Marx. I think that Gene Sharp has been more important in human history. So, and he's still alive. He lives in Massachusetts, so we're hoping to interview him for our film, but I don't know if we'll get there in time. He's very old. Um, but he runs a, an institute, and he's got lots of associates, too, who he has obviously trained and who do this work with him, so it's not like it's going to die with him. Um, anyway, um, so some conflicts do not yield to compromise and can be resolved only through struggle. Conflicts which, in one way or another, involve the fundamental principles of a society of independence, of self-respect, or people's capacity to ter determine their own future are such conflicts. For their resolution, regular institutional procedures are rarely available. It is doubtful that they could be completely adequate. So this comes down to, does the system need adjust adjusting inside a basically sound institutional framework? I think the answer is no. <laughs> or does it need more fundamental change? And if you think it needs more fundamental change, um, you're, if you're not going to do it through comp compromise. It is going to have to be some kind of a political struggle. And then, subsequent to that, you face these decisions about, well, what kind of strategies best suit the situation. But you have to face the fact that it's going to involve conflict and it's going to involve struggle. It's not going to involve persuasion. That's the problem. And so those, the, if you think that the institutions are sound, you can keep banging your head against it. It doesn't yield to those fundamental principles. That's not what systems are set up to do. So he's exactly right about this. Well, you've all seen this. You're probably yeah. well sick of it by now. But <laughs> this really does get back to that basic distinction between liberals and radicals, um, and you know, the idealism versus the pure materialism. You know, do you think that power changes because we can convince people because it's essentially a mental event based on education, or is it a concrete system of power that we're going to have to bring down? And given that you know we think it is material systems of power, what is the best way then? Um, to attack those systems of power. And the people who advocate for nonviolent direct action, they have a plan. You know, they have a, you know, a set of principles and some strategic ideas about how this can be done. And in my lifetime, I've seen some of those be very successful. So um, for us radicals, power is not a mistake. It's not a misunderstanding. It's not a disagreement. So justice is not going to be won by that individual transformation, by those educational things. It's going to be won by taking the power, the power away from the powerful and just making those institutions. So here we have Frederick Douglass, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. 
Okay, so there's two basic views about um, the nature of political power itself. Um, the one that we are all more used to is that people are dependent on um, the, the government um, for any rights that we have, or dependent on them. Um, you know, we, we need their goodwill, um, they make the decisions, and we have to support them. And that's how most of us are socialized, you know, once there's a state society, that's, you know, how we're all raised. Um, so there's a few people who stand at the pinnacle, and that power itself is self-perpetuating, um, and it sort of takes on a life of its own. Now, on the other side, um, is a more, a more radical view, I think, um, and also a more realistic view, that actually, the powerful derive their power from us. It doesn't just sort of sit there as a monolith. They have it because we give it to them. Now they have various ways to get it from us, such that we will give it to them, um, including force, including violence, including terror, you know, including dependence. Um, but the nature of that relationship is still, they are actually dependent on us, it's not the other way around. Um, and so power continually arises from many different institutions. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can have an effect on it. And it's ultimately fragile because it has to be constantly replenished from us, from the powerless, you know, from the citizens, from whoever's at the bottom. We have to consent to let this happen. And this is why I have a real problem with these liberal notions of consent, because consent is not freely given. Consent is generally something that is either ideologically extracted from us or it's extracted by terror and force. And that's the whole point of power, is to get us to consent. So, you know, consent to me is, is a, a, a posture of submission. This is not what we're after in this world. We don't want there to be consent. We want there to be, you know, fully informed people who have actual choices um, to control the material conditions of their lives, not to make choices within those conditions, but to actually control the conditions such that choice actually means something. Um, and we ultimately, as a group, we have the choice to withdraw our consent from these systems of power. So the question really becomes how best to do that. How best to make people understand that they can withdraw that consent, and then how to organize that withdrawal such that systems actually crumble. And that's what Gene Sharp's work is all about. So that first is the monolith theory of power. So it possesses this durability. Um, the only thing that controls it is by getting a better set of rulers. So please vote Democrat, because at least the Supreme Court won't be taken over by fascists. That has been true my entire life. Every single election I always voted in, there's a gun to my head, and they say, but the Supreme Court, but Roe v. Wade. That's all you said, you know, and that's the best we can ever do under the monolith theory of power. Um, and ultimately, you can only get rid of that monolith um, using some kind of destructive violence. Not true, though. The exercise of power depends on all of us consenting to it. Um, by withdrawing that consent, we can destroy the source of the power because their power is actually us. Um, and so nonviolent action, when understood and used correctly, um, we destroy the opponent's power um, by using our own means of nonviolently wielding the power that we actually have. So the question is, why do people obey? Because if we're giving up all this consent, we're giving up this power, why is that? So first is habit. Um, this is expected of us. I mean, a lot of us are, you know, when you live in an authoritarian culture, you get it from every angle, right? You know, God is an authority. The church is an authority. School is an authority. Your parents are an authority. You know, we learn to have authoritarian personalities, whether we're the dominant or the submissive, it doesn't matter. It's an authoritarian personality. And, you know, it's just, it becomes habitually psychologically to simply obey, to do what you're told. Um, and then if you question it, there are fear of sanctions. Um, and I think he makes a very important point. It's the fear of those sanctions rather than the sanctions themselves that do most of the heavy lifting in this world. Um, moral obligation. Um, so all of that cultural programming, what Marx would call the ideology, is all about making us feel guilty if we don't obey. Self-interest, um, obviously you get rewarded. You can make money, you can get prestige, you can get status if you, you know, can rise up the hierarchy. So people then become attached to their positions, even if they know they're wrong. Um, there's a psychological identification with the ruler, and I would say with the abuser. You know, it's just across the board, that's what happens in hostage situations. So you see the, you see the whole culture as a hostage situation. And Dee, Dee Graham wrote this fabulous book called Loving to Survive, and she talks about societal Stockholm Syndrome. And that's the position that we're in. It's we are the abused, and they are the abuser. Um, and so we, and so just like in hostage situations, a lot of people bond to their captives. We have bonded to the oppressors. Um, and Malcolm X talks about this a lot. I mean, you know, it's um, the role of the psychology of the oppressed in what black people have to overcome to fight white people. And that was, I think, the reason that he's still so beloved is he could name that so clearly. You know, this identification with the white man has to stop. Um, 
So all of that, the identification with the powerful, and that's a very um, huge psychological hurdle that people have to get over, um, wh whatever system it is they're fighting. Um, and then the zones of indifference, um, they don't think about it, they just do it, because it's just easier, it's what we're all used to. And then ultimately, uh, absence of self-confidence, we don't realize that we have the power to stop this. And of course, you know, our whole lives we've been trained that this is the right way, the best way, the only way, and you'll get hurt if you don't do it, so we all do it. So I think he's exactly right that this is this pretty much wraps it up. You know how it is that they are able to get millions of people. If you pick your system of oppression, they're able to get millions of people to obey with, with very little force, actually. You know once this is set in place. So when analyzing human obedience, the psychological factor is decisive. These are psychological states of mind, and this is our. This is why I said this is our hardest job as radicals is to break through that. The rest of it is honestly pretty easy. But when you can get people to face this. And, and to actually accept that there's something they can do about it, to not devolve into you know a puddle of helplessness. Um, that's the hardest part, you know. And I have this uh, friend of mine who grew up really poor, grew up rural, poor, very very hard childhood. First person in her college in her in her family to ever go to college, and she always says that her first year of college, she basically had a nervous breakdown, and it was because of this, because she suddenly had the tools to analyze capitalism in this case and the poverty that she had come from, the suffering. And she was very simple. She said, I realized there were poor people and there were rich people, and there was a relationship between the two. And just having that framework, you know, just everything collapses emotionally. It's like, look what I have participated in. Look at the situation my family is in for generations. All of that is there. All the ways that we kept ourselves poor because we're so afraid to make common cause and have a revolution. You know, and so this is it. You have to break through. And it's not a pleasant process, particularly, because you have to face a lot of pain. Um, and so uh, not everybody can do it. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Not everybody has the stalwart, the power, you know, the, the inner strength to do it. And they're not that they're bad people, but I just let people go. If they don't have it, I can't, I'm not going to talk. You know, it's not worth it. I know who I'm after, and it's people who do have it. Um, and a lot of people just don't. Either they're too broken, or they just don't have the personality that is going to give them that, that will. Um, and, you know, when I was in my 20s, I tried really hard to make everybody be that person. And I had to just face it, they aren't. But there's only some people who are going to find that courage to stand against the flow. Um, and that I couldn't make other people do it if they didn't have it. And so it's okay. People can be good people and not necessarily be radical activists. You know, they still take care of their children and they still, you know, feed hungry neighbors and do good things. But they're not going to have a political analysis and they're not going to join a political struggle. And that's okay. They don't have to. You know, they can just do their thing. There was no point in making that kind of conflict if they didn't have it. But there are people out there who will. You know, and our job is to reach them and to help them break through that denial um, and see that there is hope that we can do this. So, so his point is that the basic dichotomy um, is not between violence and nonviolence. It's really between action and inaction, between people who are willing to do something and people who aren't going to do anything. That's the main distinction. Because once you, once you realize that there's this thing called power and there's this thing called oppression and we're going to have to do something about it, everything else follows from that. But that's the main distinction is, are you going to face that or aren't you? And then are you going to take up that struggle or not? Once you do that, then you have to make decisions about, well, what are we up against? How is it structured? What are the best kinds of strategies that we might try to bring this down? But you've already made the decision to do something. And that is really the hardest. That's the moment when people decide when they cross that line. And the, you know, this decision between violence and nonviolence really does come much later, just psychologically. You know, it's just you first have to decide that you're going to fight. Okay, so um, some uh, ideas about nonviolence that aren't particularly true. Um, one is that you know, verbally appealing or begging the powerful. Um, for some kind of conciliation. That is not nonviolent direct action. That is something people can try. Sometimes it works, but that's not nonviolent direct action. Um, that is what it is. It's a verbal appeal. It's a conciliatory effort, but that's not um, actually confronting power. Um, you can try to use them with nonviolent action, but they are not actually nonviolent action. Um, so that those usually consist of either a rational or a, an emotional appeal. Um, so, writing letters to the editor, or going to talk to your congressperson, or um, making an appointment with the head of Monsanto. Um, people do these kinds of things. Um, I don't find them terribly effective, but um, you know, usually as a build-up to more radical action, people will get involved in those kinds of liberal reforms, and you know, you're welcome to try them. On occasion, they work. 
if you get enough letters, you might be able to change something small. You're not going to burn down a whole system doing that. But you might be able to get, you know, Wendy's to stop using caged hen eggs. I mean, and that's worthwhile doing. I'll write that letter. You know? um, it's not going to stop, you know, mass industrial agriculture, but you might be able to win some small reforms doing those things. Not the same as nonviolent action. Um, nonviolent action is not verbal. It consists of social, economic, and political activity of special types. So if you go to your employer and you ask for a raise, that's simple verbal persuasion. Please, I deserve a raise. I have another child to support. Um, I've been working here 10 years. You can try all kinds of appeals. Please, it's the right thing to do. You know that. Very different. Um, getting together with everybody else who works there and having a one-day work stoppage. Um, that is a case of nonviolent action. You have banded together and you have made a threat to power. And you have either done something you weren't supposed to do or with not done something that you were supposed to do. So you could draw and work from that factory or from that office place for one day. So that is actually building some power. Um, they actually can't run their businesses without us. So you recognize that and you put a stop to it, at least for a day. And so that is a good example of um, you know, the difference between the two. He said that nonviolent action is so different from these more peaceful responses um, that uh, many writers have pointed to similarities of nonviolent action to military war. And even if you decide in your own, you know, sort of musings about this, that this is an effective technique and you don't particularly want to use it, it's still worth studying for that reason, because you learn to think strategically. When you look over different cases from history, it's like, that was really great when they tried that, and you can see where they failed in these three ways. And you can apply that to any kind of struggle, really. It just teaches you to think strategically, which is always a good thing, I think. Um, so it's the meaning of combat, just like war is except you're matching forces um, without using um, weapons is really the only difference. Um, it still requires thinking about you know, the kind of strategies and battles. Um, you have to use different tactics, and you have to have soldiers who have that kind of courage and discipline and self-sacrifice. Um, but the, reason that, the way that it's different um, is that it just it simply doesn't use um, things like, like weapons, like actual arms. Um, so it's very different than passive submission, um, it is just what it says it is. Action, which is nonviolent, it's not in action. And this technique consists of active protest, not cooperation and intervention. So you're either doing something you're not supposed to do or you're withdrawing support from something that you're supposed to do. And those are sort of the two main sort of kinds of nonviolent action. So it can be used to achieve limited objectives like uh, bringing down segregation, um, used very successfully throughout the South for this, as we know. They actually called this the Second Civil War. But these were the original four guys who kicked that off. Um, it can also be used to destroy whole regimes. So here they are pulling down the Berlin Wall, which some of you are old enough to remember that. It was an amazing day to be alive. Um, so here they are. This was the uh, People's Power Movement in the Philippines, which I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. Uh, very successful use of nonviolent direct action. Um, so Marcos, as probably most of you know, um, spent almost 20 years in charge of the Philippines. He was a horrible dictator. He, pretty much used the country as his personal country club. Um, he controlled the banks, he controlled the media, he controlled the military. They had a constitution that said you could only serve for eight years total as president and he was there for 20. So he kept suspending the constitution and declaring himself the president. Um, and they hadn't had free elections in a good long time. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of protests against him and the popular movement starts to build. Um, in 1983, um, the person in the parliament who was most likely to um, be able to head a resistance movement against him was um, Benino Aquino, and he had been living in exile for a few years because his life was in danger from this man. And he decides to return to the Philippines to actually run for president against him. And he steps off the airplane onto the tarmac in Manila and is shot immediately. He was not there 10 seconds and they assassinate him. So there's a huge, just a huge uprising against this. So it's a flashpoint you know, in the struggle. And um, Marco said something incredibly stupid, which was that he banned the television, the televising of his funeral. And what happened, so what happened instead, people would have stayed home and just watched it on television, and they didn't. They flooded the streets instead. So you've got millions of people now all over the Philippines in the streets, and this goes on for 11 hours, where they are, they're realizing that they've got some power and they've had enough. So there's this huge, spontaneous, you know, basically giant demonstration across the whole country in the wake of his funeral. Um, and so... This goes on basically two and a half years. There's this nonviolent resistance movement. Um, his widow, Cori Aquino, decides to run against him instead because she's got the name recognition. Um, and so uh, 
Marcos is under tremendous pressure to actually have a free election because there hasn't been one. So they go ahead and they have a, basically a fake election. And everybody knows the thing is completely rigged and it's marked by violence across the whole country. And Marcos declares himself the winner. And everybody knows it's completely fraudulent. So she says, no, I'm the winner. So now you've got two competing people say, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. So she sp speaks to a crowd of over a million people alive, this huge live speech where she has a seven point plan of nonviolent resistance and how we're gonna take power from Marcos. Um, and so, for instance, this complete boycott of all banks that he has and all the, the media that he controls, and just, with, just withdraw your support from all his businesses, which they do. Um, and also there's gonna be various kinds of protests and she encourages everybody to get involved. Um, so they start doing this and it, it gets more and more successful. Um, by 1986, there's this amazing day where, and in a lot of these struggles around the world, um, one thing that has to happen is that the military and the police have to switch their loyalty. And it doesn't mean they necessarily join the struggle as an armed body, but they stop obeying orders. And this is always a very crucial moment, okay? And that starts to happen. There's two men who are, one of them's in the army, um, who's head of the, part of the army, and the other one is, um, he runs, he's chief of staff. And his name is Fidel Ramos, and the other guy is, his last name's Enrile. And they barricade themselves inside the Defense Ministry headquarters in Manila with some of the other troops who are very sympathetic. And they say point blank, we're not doing this anymore, you can kill us, but we're tired of supporting the dictator. And they hole up inside the barracks. And Marcos basically laughs at them and says, hey, two tanks, and you're gone, we're just going to blow you pieces. And what happens at that point is that the Catholic Church is huge in the Philippines, and they have their own radio station, um, which was called uh, Radio Veritas. And they get on the airwaves, and then they tell people what's happening in Manila, and they said, come defend them. This makes me cry, but the civilians come and protect the military in the face of this. So they surround the barracks, there's thousands of people, and they come out, and this, I now remember this, because I was you know, a young adult at that point, but it's like whole families of people, full people, children, oh it's just incredible. They protected the soldiers. And um, so at that point, the military starts to fall, because he can't get them to open fire on all these people. And um, there's these pictures, of course, of the nuns, because it being a Catholic country, you know, where the nuns and the priests stand in front, it's like nobody was gonna fight on the nuns and the priests, which isn't gonna happen. So they lead the way for a lot of this. And um, eventually the tanks withdraw from the headquarters. And um, they then the, um, he still keeps saying, oh, I won the election, and he wants to have a big party. And of course, it's a complete failure, nobody goes. And he's in the middle of this big bloviating speech about how he's going to, you know, take control again, and he wants there to be martial law, and there's going to be a big curfew. And, and there's another group of soldiers who have defected, and they take over the, uh, the state-run television, and they cut him off midstream. So he's like, bleh, 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 you know, doing his Marcos thing, and it just goes dead, just completely dead. It was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> so then the same thing happens, where Marcos is like, all right, well, we're going to go take back the, the radio station, the TV station. And then, again, the call goes out to all the civilians, protect them. So they do the same thing. There's thousands of people in the circle protecting the soldiers from the other soldiers, right? And uh, the same thing happens. You know, they're giving orders to fire and they won't do it. So the tanks withdraw. And by the end of that night, it's just, there's this man who, you know, ruled the Iron Fist for 20 years and he's just this pathetic dog, basically, begging on the telephone, will somebody take me in because I have to get out of here. And they sneak out the back door of the palace and the U.S. flies into Guam and that's the end of it. And Cory Aquino is the president. And... I gotta say, it was an amazing thing to behold. It was like when apartheid fell, and you're like, how did this actually happen in my lifetime? Um, you know, the problem is that it doesn't end there. And I have a commentary that somebody else wrote about it, which I think, you know, is well taken to heart. While the Philippine Revolution deposed a powerful dictator, it left much of the old centralized power structure unchanged. The U.S. still retained major influence through military aid and bases. Um, the new president, Korea Aquino, was from a wealthy family. The poor was to poor, the rich were still in charge, capitalism emerged stronger than ever. What the story of the Philippine Revolution demonstrates is the power people can have when they withdraw consent. The same dynamics apply no matter what the issue. Had Filipinos decided to go on and struggle for a more equitable distribution of wealth, the abolition of the military or a decentralized government that was more responsive to their needs, who knows what more amazing things they might achieve. So, you know, to be continued, it's not like this is over. Um, you know, having won that kind of success, I think people know what they're capable of. So, you know, all power to them, but hopefully they get further, you know, because like it says, a lot of these powers are still there. You know, it was it was one big step, but it certainly wasn't the end. So, okay, it can also be used to de defend a legitimate government under attack. So, this is Prague. So this is Czechoslovakia. Um, another example I'm gonna talk about for a minute. 
Um, so it's the 1960s. Um, Czechoslovakia was still part of the Eastern Bloc, so it's a satellite of the Soviet Union. Um, and in 1966, there's some fairly radical reformers who come to power up through the Communist Party there, and they decide they want to do some, some reforms. And so uh, there's definitely a culture of resistance because a lot of this is led by the writers and the intellectuals, and what they really want is freedom of speech, so it's a huge demand. Um, they want freedom to travel outside of the country, um, another big demand, and then they want to do all these economic reforms because it's just not worth it. This kind of state socialism thing was just a complete disaster. So they want all these kinds of freedoms, and they elect, uh, there's two people in particular that get elected. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the one guy's name, and I'm really sorry, Svoboda maybe, and then the other guy's name was um, Dovchek. And they're the head of the Communist Party, and they start to do this. They start to institute these reforms, and of course, the Kremlin goes nuts. You can't do this. Um, and so there's all this euphoria because they're going to have these reforms, and it's called Prague Spring. Um, but what happens, of course, is that the Soviet Union um, is, is very disturbed that you know their control is slipping away. So there's all these negotiations back and forth about, well, maybe you could take it a little slower. Well, all right, we'll go a little slower, but we're still going to have this. We're not, we're not backing down. Um, and so they feel like, everybody feels like the negotiations have gone well. In the middle of the night on August 20th in 1968, um, the Soviet Union rolls in with tanks, and they send in 500 tanks and over half a million soldiers come flooding in from the Eastern Bloc countries into little Czechoslovakia um, to stop this, you know, essential revolution from happening. Um, now, the Czechoslovakian army could have held out for maybe four days. Okay, that's how tiny they are compared to the might of the Soviet Empire. And so the Soviets are assuming they're going to be there for four days, and that'll be the end of it. They'll put in a puppet government, and that'll be the end of this. Um, but this show, the, the Czechoslovakians do something interesting. They tell their army to stand down. They said, we're never going to win. There's no point. This is going to be a mass slaughter. Don't even bother. We're going to try something else. So they try what's called a civilian-based defense, is what Gene Sharp calls it. Um, and so they, they have uh, underground radio stations that spring up immediately, and they're able to drive around the trucks. So they're moving the radio station every day, and they put out over the airwaves basic theory about how nonviolent resistance should work. And so they tell everybody to withdraw you know, all their support for you know, whatever the Soviets are telling you to do, and they do all these spontaneous actions around the country. And this goes on for eight months, and they're, they're able to do this very successfully. Um, and they get a lot of the, um, like, sports figures and different, like, movie stars and stuff to be some of the radio announcers. So there's, like, this sort of party atmosphere to the whole thing as well, part of it. Um, and they're really able to stop the Soviets from completely taking control. So the first thing they do is they have a work stoppage. So there's a noise. You're supposed to make a lot of noise for an hour. So it's 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. And all the sirens go off and all the church bells ring. People honk their horns. And wherever you are, you just stop doing what you're doing. So all the highways back up. And the Soviets are still trying to get all their tanks into the country. And they can't because there's no way. They've literally clogged the infrastructure completely. And nobody can get in or out. Um, another thing they're told to do is to take down all the street signs and all the highway signs. So even when the tanks are there, they have no idea where they're going. And they're literally driving in circles. And they're standing here with maps, and they can't figure out. And they all change the name of their town to, like, Dubcheck or the other guy's name. So no matter where you go, you're in these. They don't know where they are. And they were able to actually direct some of the military convoys right back out of the country. No, keep going. Keep going this way. And out they, back, they went that way. Um, they had all kinds of human blockades, like this one, where they blockaded bridges just using human power. Um, and the Soviets backed down. They wouldn't open fire on all these people. They, so they would just remove the tanks from the situation. Um, and then they were bringing in equipment to block the radio because they could see that this was really important. Now they're getting word out. Um, so they had radio walking equipment. And somehow the Czechoslovakians found out about it. And they were going to be transporting it by rail. So they told the rail workers, do whatever you can. So the electricity mysteriously failed for all the rail lines. And then when the Soviets got it back up and running, um, the train that carried the equipment was actually shuttled off you know, to various little passes. And then eventually, you know, there was a huge train in front and a huge train in back. And it was wedged between and could go nowhere. So they made it impossible to move the equipment. They just completely blocked the infrastructure. And eventually, the Soviets had to bring it in by helicopter because it was the only way they could get it in. And the other thing was that they didn't with any kind of supplies because they thought this was going to be over in four days. So they had these disgusting um, meals that were powder that you had to mix with water. That was the only thing the troops had to eat. And um, all the people in all the villages and towns shut off the water. So they had no water. And they would break the pipes if they had, so there would be no water. And they were forced to use water from some of the local rivers, which were completely disgusting, just open sewers, essentially. And they all got sick. So they made the army sick just by not giving them water. So that was actually really effective as well. So this went on and on. Um, they were able to, like I said, able to get this going for about eight months, which is a good long time, especially with people who really had no training in how to do this. 
Um, and then eventually, of course, um, the two leaders were taken by force to Moscow and were told that this had to end and their lives were threatened. And they did agree to um, a lot of the concessions that the Soviets wanted. Um, and there was, it was greatly demoralizing to the people that the leadership caved at that point. And it's hard to say what you would do in that situation. I mean, they were going to be executed otherwise. Um, that doesn't mean they had to do it, though. Like, you can agree and then slip on home or something. I don't know. Um, but, it, you know, it's a great quote. Because of the near-unanimous civilian resistance throughout the country, even conservative leaders were reluctant to collaborate with the Soviets. No one could be found to form a public government that had a facade of legitimacy. So they couldn't find anybody. All right, all right, I'll be your puppet. There's usually some you know, sort of quizzling who's willing to take the money and the power and betray their people, and they couldn't find anyone. Um, so eventually the whole thing sort of collapses, but, you know, it's not over because 20 years later, in 1989, you know, they learned from this experience, and they used the same techniques only with more training and did, in fact, you know, win their freedom after the Berlin Wall fell. Very successful uses of nonviolent resistance just across that whole region. Um, and there's a commentary here about you know, the two things that they probably should have done. The one real problem with what they did was that it was a series of spontaneous actions. There was no overall plan to get the Soviets out. They didn't know how to do it. I mean, they just were too new to this. So without an overarching strategy, it was like, well, hit him here, hit him there, try this, try that. And eventually it just kind of collapsed. They weren't able to keep it up. They gave it all, they're all, obviously, eight months is a good long run, but it didn't work in the end because they lacked an overall strategy. So that was one thing they learned, and they had a better strategy in 1989, 1990. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people suggest is that the, those two big leaders should have gone underground or gone into exile, and they could have run it from another country, from a, you know any, anywhere in Western Europe would have taken them, and they should have just done it that way. Um, and then they couldn't have de decapitated the movement so quickly by simply, you know, taking them into captivity. And that's probably true. So, so those were things that you know you, you learn in hindsight after you've tried this. Um, but, you know, another very successful um, use of this technique. And, you know, again, by 1989, 1990, when the Berlin Wall falls, um, they knew a lot more about how to run these campaigns. Um, I, my family's from Latvia, and so, of course, we were watching that, you know, around the clock when that was going on. And the, it was amazing, you know, in the aftermath of all that, to learn that they actually, um, they had Gene Sharp's books, like in Latvia and Lithuania, for sure. And they were, uh, the people who spoke English would be just, just, up all night, 24 hours, like around the clock. They had typewriters, they didn't have computers, and they're translating page by page as best as they can. And then whoever had access to a Xerox machine was making copies, so they had the chunks that were the most important, you know, from the strategy books, stapling them together, and then just going out into the public, because there are all these spontaneous demonstrations as all this starts to happen. You have to read this. So anybody who would read it got a copy. It was like, understand the principles, because we've got a plan. But you all need to know what we're doing. We all need to be on board. This doesn't work with just 10 of us. Everybody in this country needs to understand principles of nonviolent direct action if this is going to work. And they were able to get enough of the word out because only four people died in the Baltics when they won independence. So it was really cool. So it can work. And then the final thing is, um, okay, so this, um, it actually impinges upon the opponent's power more directly than violence does. And the reason that's true is because their power comes from us. And that's the real insight to why this technique works. Um, when we withdraw that power, and we have to do that politically, this is not an emotional state, right? That's where a lot of the left is gone, that's the problem. When that's done politically, economically, socially, we then take our power back, they are left with nothing. And they're left being Marcos on the tarmac saying, somebody please take me in. That's what we can do to these people, you know, if we understand that the power is actually ours. Um, and so it strikes at the rulers, their actual power, their source of power, which is us. So if we get those seven reasons that people obey, that's really our job is to break through those and show people that it's possible. So political violence is present in any hierarchical society where status, wealth, and decision-making power are concentrated in an elite, and they're willing to use violence to maintain their dominance. Um, so it's expressed directly through you know, these terrible things that happen, but it's most importantly, it works through the threat of that. It works through the fear of that. Um, and that's where we have to, you know, help people find the courage to overcome um, that fear because it's a very real fear. So when we challenge that system, um, the way that nonviolence works is that the violence is so that, that the violence is always there, but it's structural, so we don't actually see it. It's woven into the economy. It's woven into law. You know, it's woven into the court system, into the education system. It's there every day. These systems surround us. 
but we don't see the violence because we don't, we don't, they don't have to, right? They're not surrounding us with guns 24 seven. They don't have to. Um, but when you stand up to power, right? When you present some kind of challenge, it makes the basic nature of the system visible, finally. It makes the violence visible. So it takes structural violence and it makes it visible. And that's how the technique works, ultimately. And what you're seeing here is pictures from the Children's Crusade in Birmingham, Alabama, when they ran out of adults um, who were willing to do uh, civil disobedience, they asked the children to come out, and they did. And uh, these pictures electrified the world. When, when these 12 year olds could stand up to fire hoses and police dogs. But that's exactly what happened. It made the structural violence, which is usually invisible to most of us, even though we live under it every day, it's invisible. It makes it visible. You can't not see this for what it is. So it strips the sanctity from the law and it compels the application of sanctions. And so it converts just general domination to naked force. It converts it to machine guns and fire hoses and police dogs. I and mean, everyone has to see, yes, this is a system that we're up against. Um, so all that violence on which it ultimately depends is finally revealed. It's naked, you know, before the eye. Everyone has to see what's going on. Um, and we don't create that violence when we fight back. We simply reveal that it's there. So he calls it the political jujitsu um, because you're forcing them to, to react and to show the violence. Um, we alienate the regime, regime from its supporters who could possibly support turning fire hoses on children, right? So there's this huge upswell around the world when those pictures went public from Birmingham. I mean, the world's just electrified by right? so just horrible stuff. Um, it promotes much greater solidarity um, within this group because now you've got the bonding, you know, that you've been through this together. Um, it arouses the opinion of the world against the regime. So you'll have other governments, other activist groups around the world giving you support. How do we help? What do you need? Economic sanctions, all kinds of stuff can happen. And um, it ultimately demonstrates that um, you can't compel submission across the board. That some people are going to fight back. And that helps break through that obedience, those seven ways that people will obey. It shows that it doesn't have to be that way and that people can find their courage. So, um, this point is crucial. Um, you have to agree um, to nonviolent discipline for it to work. The problem is, if, if the powers that be react, which you're trying to provoke, you're trying to provoke a violent reaction, when they respond with the violence, the problem is if you come back with more violence, it now looks like a riot in the street, um, it's no longer clear. That stark naked, yes, they are now using violence. That is now very visible to us. It's no longer obvious to the world what's going on. What they see is a riot. And so this, this technique stops working. Um, and this is the problem with concepts like diversity of tactics. If you are trying to build a nonviolent resistance movement, but you've got people in your group who are gonna do things like burn cars and light dumpsters on fire and you know get into constant battles with the police in the streets, um, it's not going to be as obvious to the outside world, to other people who should be your comrades, what's actually going on. When you can make that incredibly obvious and just absolutely naked power, that's when you're gonna get the most support from the other people. Um, the people that you need to join, whether you know other governments, other organizations who can apply sanctions, or other people on the ground who need to join, you need to join to build the movement. Um, it doesn't work to mix it up. You've gotta pick one or the other, essentially, um, in your struggle. So these are the women in Liberia who um, the Civil War was absolutely wrecking the place and they put an end to it by doing this. Um, and there's a great movie about what they did. It's called Pray the Devil Back to Hell, um, which documents how they were able to use nonviolence very effectively to stop men from killing everybody. Um, some of the statistics from Liberia are pretty gruesome. 80% of the population has been raped. That's everybody, men, women, and children have been raped. Like you're talking about just massive levels of trauma and they just had enough. So they just using absolute, they had nothing but their own bodies. I mean, there's not a single weapon. And they were able to not just break down the government, but to just stop this just gas this little war that was never going to end. Um, and this was how they did it, it was by using this nonviolent discipline. Um, this is a very hard point for people to get to, but um, it is crucial um, for nonviolence to work. So if this isn't something that you want to do, that's fine. Um, DGR certainly has other strategies that we believe in. But if you're going to be part of building those above ground um, populist movements, they really do need to be nonviolent um, in their uh, strategy if, you, if you're going to build a mass movement. Um, if you want to build something else, that's fine, and we can talk about whether that's effective or not, because sometimes it is, as we all know. But if this is the kind of movement you're going to build, then you have to stick to nonviolent discipline. Otherwise, it doesn't, the technique doesn't work. 
So it doesn't work because it's moral or because it's spiritually superior. And this is where you get into the fights with the pacifists. That's not the reason that it works. That might be the reason some people are attracted to it. And again, I don't think it's worth trying to convince people otherwise. Um, if this is their calling, you're not going to change that. And this is some people's calling. You know, they really are called to a more pacifist um, approach to life and approach to the cosmos and approach to their own um, relationships. This is just what—it's just who they are and it's the kind of world they want. And I understand they're wanting to be that world now. And it's, it's not worth it to me to get into real debates with them. It's, I just let it go. It's fine. Um, but that's not why this works. And that's the point of disagreement that I am willing to have because this doesn't work by moral persuasion. Um, it exposes violence, it demystifies the power, it makes that brutally obvious, it breaks through the psychology of the oppressed and the reasons that people obey, and ultimately it's about withdrawing the support, which is the only power that they have, is our consent, and it withdraws that. And that these are the three reasons that this technique works. Okay? So it's not about persuasion, and it's not about epiphany, and it's nothing spiritual. It's very, very practical. This is how it works. And these are my questions for DGR. I mean, this is one of the most elegant political techniques that I've ever seen in my lifetime. It's been wielded very effectively across the world. Um, I mean, I hear bizarre things from people on the internet. It doesn't work. What are you talking about? They've brought down so many regimes in my lifetime using this. Of course it works. But the question is, is it going to work in the struggle that we're in? Do we have enough people? Because it takes massive numbers of people. And do we have enough time? I mean, from generation to generation, people had to learn how to do this. You know, they did some things in 1969, some it worked, some of it didn't. By 1989, they figured out some more, and all right, the Soviet Union collapsed and they got away. But that's 20 years. Do we have 20 years? And do we have massive numbers of people? And my problem is I answer no to both of these, which is why I wrote a book called Deep Green Resistance, because I didn't see it. And with all my heart, I wish that we could do it the other way because of the elegance of that technique and the fact that you can't do it without killing anyone. That, that appeals to me on a very, very deep level. I'm not someone who can bl be blasé about considering the loss of life. That hurts people. And it's just, it's with a great moral weariness that I have come to this position. But what have we got? Two years? Five years? Maybe ten years? I don't know. Not enough time for what we need. This is massive. So, all right, fallback plan for me is let's go for the infrastructure because that'll do it. And it may create a lot of chaos in the meantime, but that's a strategy that I can see. ABC, we got it. 500 people, I think, could know it, at least in the United States. So that's how I answered those questions for myself. I don't expect these answers to be easy for anyone, and I don't want them to be easy. They're, these are, to me, these are very, very morally complex issues because we are talking about we are talking about great harm to humans potentially. We're talking about the death of the planet, on the other hand, and we're also talking about the trauma to our own emotional, our own psyches and our own souls, really. And I don't expect people to take that up easily. I'm willing to do that. It's like, I don't care at this point for my own self. Whatever, bad karma give it to me, I'll take it. It's fine. I will purify it. Like, whatever, I don't care. But this, but I don't, I don't want people to come to this easily. If you're going to come to this easily, I don't want you to do it. You're not the right person. This needs to be something that is very slow and painful of a, of a, a resolution because it's dead serious. So I don't want us to, to answer these questions. Um, these are not facile in any way. This, this shouldn't be easy. Um, and I know the internet does not facilitate deep, long, profound conversations. And that, I know that makes it hard as well, because a lot of this happens on Facebook and whatnot. But I just don't want us to be the people that take, this, um, that take these questions for granted, because they're, they're not easy questions. So that's my presentation. Um, I highly recommend Gene Sharp's work. And that should just be like one of those ground zero things we all read in UGR. Even if you decide it's not the technique you like or want to use, I, it just, you learn so much about history and so much about people's courage and then also ultimately how to think strategically, you know, like blockading bridges and turning off the water supply and the electricity, all that could be done nonviolently, could be done other ways, but it works when you do it. That's really the point. And whether you do it nonviolently or using some other method is not even the point, really. The point is that these things can be done. And that's really the, the take home message, I think, for a lot of it. So, all right, I'm just rambling. I guess I'm over. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, we've got a bit of a break. It's a little before 11 now. At 11 15, the group is going to be split. Uh, Sam has graciously volunteered to lead a warrior uh, sisters training. And so, the women are going to convene around her and decide where they're going to be. The men are going to be having a male ally discussion, and that's going to be in the apartment. So at 11.15, all the men over there. Fair enough?
right, we got about 15 minutes. Thanks, everyone. Do we want to do questions? We can. Yeah. There's yeah. no much for one or two or discussion, yeah. really. Oh, it's not like I got great it's answers. It's actually only 10.45, so we got like, Maybe five minutes, a couple, couple discussion <laughs> points. What you got, Fred? So we just start right now. Um, I went, he has a three part series that's called um, The Politics of Non Healthcare Adaption. And it's, there's three parts, three big volumes. But they go really fast. It's like reading a novel, I think. Um, that's where I would start. But any, any of this stuff is very. There's, there's, there's a movie made about, a couple of movies actually about his work, but the, the one, the really big one's called How to Start a Revolution. And it sort of goes through just the basic stuff how this works, why this works, when it works, and then people who've tried it and their successes or not. It's a good movie. How do you that? I don't. It's really hard. First of all, a lot of it, it seems like such a great area that people are going to draw those lines in really different places. And, you know, when you do a lot of nonviolent, the direct action training, so they do that stuff where they line you up across the room. Do you think this is violence or not? And then you sort of put yourself where you think, you know, from nonviolent to completely violent, where do you think this particular action falls? And the spectrum of opinions is usually really big. I mean, even things like having a checking account, do you think that's violence? And it's like, well, actually, yeah, I get that I'm giving my money to a bank. You know, it's global capitalism. Um, so on one level, it's like, well, we have to have respect for the fact that we're working together and this is going to be some kind of coalition effort. It was my struggle. I don't think blockading a road is anything that's violent. That is one of the basic tactics of nonviolent resistance is you blockade things with your body. Boulders are fine. You're not hurting anyone by using boulders or by using cars or trucks. That's tried and true across the world. I mean, that's one thing that people do all the time. You know, they'll pull, think if you can get the truckers on your side, like in France, they do this all the time. They have to slow down on the, you know, the highways. Like, all the, oh, the truckers line up and they'll go 10 miles an hour. You know, it's like they just completely blockade the roads. And I, I don't say that as violent. So, to tell the story the way that they want to tell it. And it's hard because the media is not our friend. Right. You know, it's, I always tell people, you know, we're going to be talking to the media. It's like, this is just one step down from talking to cops. And I'm not kidding about that. I mean, they're psychopaths, a lot of them. Or they have such a completely different worldview that they might as well be psychopaths to me. You know, like, they're really out for a story. They don't have any moral bearing about whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. They just want a certain story. That's what I came to realize about most reporters. There are some wonderful reporters out there, I don't mean to say. You know, the people like Darcy Mountain don't exist. They do, and they're in it for the right reasons. But a lot of these just mainstream people, it's like they're evil clowns. All they want is a story. And they'll get you to say whatever and then use it to tell their stories. Like, but that's not what I said. It certainly isn't what I meant. You have to be so careful. And that's what I mean. It's like talking to the cops. These people are not your friends. And it's so hard to get control of the narrative. And how do you make that? Your actions have to speak louder. You know, that's certainly for sure. So, okay. Um, yeah. uh, this is a different way to articulate. Um, so I, I totally agree with what you were saying. That really struck home to me about the diversity of tactics messing up the message. And I feel like we've seen that a lot with, um, kind of like modern day environmental protests where like some people are turning over garbage cans and other people are like, no, and then there's like the, the fight between like, them, and, like the black lock, and then it's a total mess. But I really wonder for our sake, if there can be strategic industrial sabotage happening on w within an underground simultaneously while an above ground movement is practicing strictly nonviolent direct action. And if those two things could actually complement each other and not just be one or the other. And I, and I see that that could complicate the message, especially if they're fighting for the same cause. But I do want, like, I wonder what you think about that. If, if it's strategic and intelligent targeted actions happening on the one hand and then a response to government repression happening from the public in a nonviolent way. That's the line that we're trying to walk, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Who knows how it's going to end? Yeah. I think it has to be tried at this point because I don't see any other options. Yeah. So I've only said, let's try it. You know, yeah. this is enough. Oh, well. Hopefully that group is separate enough from the above ground groups that you know, if the above ground groups just want to dissociate themselves completely from saboteurs, all right, that's the price we've had. I don't actually care. I know that men was loved by the local community. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, a lot of those groups aren't. They're just, just armed, you know, bandits, yeah. essentially. They're pretty awful. But um, men was not. They were protected. They were you know, taken in. They were hit, fed, all of that, taken care of by the local people. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. Just most of that happened in Nigeria was on island. I mean, they were officially formed for led by women who were just massive on the way to small shut down shell and whatnot. Um, so they did work in tandem. Yeah. You know, so I think it can be done. 
but it's a tricky line. Yeah. And we're going to have to walk it. I don't see that we've got a choice. There's nobody serious about saving this planet. This is just going to happen. But I, I wish that it didn't, because it, it does not make it does make, it money is a different question. It does not make the short-term allowance obvious anymore. Now we're on a totally different kind of strategy. It doesn't work with the first one. You know? So, oh well. Yeah. 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 Who? Oh, Carson. Oh, what was I going to say? Um, I just wanted to, when I was uh, working on the Resistance Rewritten presentation at Phil two years ago, one of the thoughts I had was that, like, um, it's really, there's a lot of really great lessons we can learn from these historical struggles, and, like, the, all the principles of nonviolence hold true, but I do think that because nonviolence works in such a very specific yeah. way, yeah. it isn't really, it doesn't really change or evolve, whereas the state's response to nonviolence is constantly changing and evolving and, and getting better and better and more, you know, like, nuanced and, um, like, like the example, you know, like it worked really, like the, that image of children getting hit with fire hoses or just, you know, um, uh, or like in the civil rights movement or the Indian independence movement, you know, you have these police goons with these sticks and they beat people and there was blood in the streets and it was so visceral and, it, you know, any feeling person, you know, knows what it's like to, has empathy for someone getting hit with a baton. But what do they use now? These shotgun beanbag yeah. rounds, these tasers, these gas, you know? Yeah. It's not relatable. There's not that empathetic, immediate empathetic response. It's like the state's response to nonviolence is mechanized. It's it's um, it's so abstract. And it the ways that nonviolence, uh, the, the techniques the state has for dealing with nonviolence um, make a lot of these... Um, a lot of these um, principles of nonviolence, like um, uh, dissociating people's um, loyalty to the, to the state and um, uh, pulling supporters away from the state, like it, it just, it's hard to do that now because of the ways the state has of um, sabotaging nonviolent movements and dealing, redirecting that energy, you know? It's true. And they also only show it to the what they want to. I know. And yeah. then the rest, you know, people put up. Now that everyone has phones, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, the, and the best thing about that is it goes on social media, but the media, mm -hmm. what they report is, I mean, when you read, when Dominique went to Baltimore, mm -hmm. what she said yeah. happened there and how it got reported was so, so she said people were literally being snatched off their front porches. Yeah. And they weren't doing anything. None of that got reported. And she said there was a lot of plain clothes policemen in the crowd inciting people to like riot and you know starting some of it themselves so that you know that whole thing got really confused and it got reported as up people just like as you said it's a riot. It's not it's no longer something that many people in this country watching that would be sympathetic to or think. <laughs> well, uh, the only good thing is that that's always been the case. I mean, it, so, as soon as long as we've been in mass media, it's been a propaganda arm of the state. So in some ways, we've always been up against that. I mean, it really couldn't be any worse than, you know, Hitler's propaganda machine or, you know, Stasi or whatever the hell. Like, it's, you know, these complete lockdowns that, I mean, we do have more, some more access to mass media than other groups have had. I'm not a big believer in social media. I don't, I mean, I fucking hate the internet, but it is true that, you know, we can at least get some of the word out. They can't stop it if we can get the images to them. So there's that as well. But I hear what you're saying. And I mean, there's, there's psychological control of using the media is, I mean, it gets better and better. Capitalism just does that. It gets better and better, you know, what it does. So, I mean, they have ways to market to people who don't buy things. Like, that's literally the people they market to. <laughs> that's me, you know? <laughs> so how are you making me buy things, you know? It's, it's, that's what they do. They're really good at it. So, yeah, no, it's tough. I was thinking about Sam, thinking about, like, how they work together, and I was thinking about, like, the civil rights movement with, like, Robert F. Williams and the Deacons of Defense, who were, like, integrating swimming pools by coming with gangs of armed men and saying, like, we will shoot police who try and take us from this pool. Like, there was, there have been those military sides. Yeah. And I think the big thing was just trying to make sure, 
and it might not be possible to make sure that the peaceful people don't condemn the people who are in their very separate way being radical. Like, because a lot of those nonviolent civil rights people would, would not condemn the vegans of defense, and I think that's what helps. You know, if, if Bill McKibben or whatever sees a sabotage and says, oh, this isn't the right way, like, that's the danger, I think. Because that's when it really, like, can turn people against each other. It'd be really interesting to know what Bill McKibben would do. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Very curious. <laughs> WWBN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I think also, like, you, like, there's that great quote by Martin Luther yeah. Jr. where he's like, I'm not going to condemn the riots without condemning the social system. Yeah, and so whatever, like, that's another yeah. thing, like, even when we're like, hey guys, don't burn top parts up, like, we should still keep the focus on the fact that the system drives people to do that, even if we're like, it's not a good idea, but... Well, he, yeah. he, he says we've got no right, if anyone wants to do that, that's what they feel, they think, you know, the, 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 you know, yeah, I mean, like indigenous people, you know, if they, you know, will, will be right away, if that's how they want to do that, their struggle, it's... I, I think I support that. Personally. But we need to move away from like a right space, like what you have the right to do, I yeah. think, towards like what's strategic. Because, like, yeah, the right to burn down any building you want, probably. But, yeah. 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 Maybe not, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got the numbers, so you know, that's why I'm in DGR and on the street pricing, yeah. But, yeah. 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 Yeah.